host Jasmine Theron, joining you for the next four weeks. And I'm Claire Abbotts. Thank God Jacob is finally gone. Or is he? Yes, he is. Later in the show, we'll be showing an experimental short film, and we'll take a look at the latest Marvel film, Thor The Dark World. But first, we'd like to introduce today's guest host, the host of Turning Points with Sean Bindley on 31 Digital. Obviously, it's Sean Bindley. Welcome to the show. Hi, Claire. How are you going? Jasmine? Hey. So could you tell us a bit about Turning Points? What was your inspiration behind the show? <coughs> I've presented a number of shows here over the years, and I'd always been interested in this notion that there are moments in people's lives that will affect them down the track and oftentimes you don't realise that that moment's actually passing. Sometimes you do. You have a decision where you can say, okay, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Oftentimes people don't have the luxury of actually taking control of that decision. So I was interested in talking to people who'd had experiences like that and I've had a lot of them in my life as well where they could look back on how things had changed whether they'd actually been able to control that decision, whether that decision had been taken out of their hands, how that actually dealt with the consequences of that decision as well. Some really interesting guests. Mm, yeah, you've got, there's quite a variety of guests yeah. on the show. Um, because I know that, uh, Priscilla was a guest who actually actively chose her, made her choice, in a way, I suppose. Pr Priscilla, uh, Priscilla had been, she was conceived in Biloela. Mm -hmm. um, and at that stage in Australia in the early 70s, they were using 245T as a defoliant. Mm -hmm. So they were spraying it all over the town. And she was born without a fibula in her leg mm -hmm. and spent 27 odd years walking around in pain, mm -hmm. um, always visiting with her specialist. And after it was just getting worse and worse, it got to the stage where she would get off the train from work and get in a cab in order to go the 200 metres to get home. And she was speaking to her specialist with whom she'd meet twice a year and eventually a specialist said to her, you know, have you ever thought about just cutting it off? Mm. And she went, well, no, I didn't know that I could, but mm, leave it with me. And she went off and she did a due diligence and she did the research and she made an, an informed decision about what would be better for her. And she had her leg amputated in order for her to be able to live a pain-free life, which is what she does now. Wow. Mm. And of course she went on from there and created these art installations all around the world made out of prosthetic limbs that had been, that had been turned into art. She's a remarkable person. And that's a classic yeah. example of how somebody can take charge of their decision or this moment in their life and it can take them off somewhere else that they never could have dreamed of. Yeah, you have so many fascinating guests on there. Like, but people like that who have had such major things happen often don't even recognise themselves. They're just like, you know, it's something I did and they're yeah. quite humble about it. So how did you even go about finding these amazing stories. Well, we sort of, um, Nigel Brennan was probably a classic example mm. that, that Nigel had been in the press a fair bit and he just released a new book and obviously there's people out there interested in doing promotion and stuff and Nigel had been doing the rounds and we, we asked him if he'd be interested in coming on the show and he was happy to do that and that was a great story. That's how we opened the, the, the show. Um, Nigel had travelled to Somalia with a, with a journalist from Canada to do a story on the Somalian refugee camps and um, mm. without spoiling too much of the story, they ended up being kidnapped by Somali teenagers wow. and held captive in Mogadishu for 15 months. And they were beaten and Amanda, who was the, the, the journalist who was with him, she was repeatedly sexually assaulted mm. and the Australian government did nothing to help them get out. Wow. They actually managed to escape from where they were being held and then were recaptured in a mosque and beaten with AK-47s and carried through the streets of Mogadishu over these teenagers' wow. heads and locked in manacles for another 12 months, I think. How did they get back? <laughs> um, eventually, their family spoke to a guy. I, 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 I describe him as a Russell Crowe type, as that type of character who, when you've been kidnapped in South America or wherever, you get the million dollars together and you give it to that dude and he comes in with all guns blazing and he rescues you. Yeah wasn't quite as dramatic as that but <laughs> once Nigel's family realised that they really weren't getting anywhere and it had been 14 months and nobody was helping them they were given this guy's number he'd recently been involved in the in the rescue of another hostage mm. and they rang him up and said this is the situation we don't know how to move forward from this do you think you can help us and he said yeah of course I can how much money have you got and they said well we've got about 450 and he said well I think you need another 150 and mm. I should be able to get them free for that and they said, well, we're completely tapped out. We don't know where we can go to get any more money. And he said, well, here's a list of benefactors who've been known to help out people in your situation. Why don't you just start calling from the top, tell them your situation and see if anybody's willing to help you out. Dick Smith was the first guy on the top of the oh, list. Wow. They rang him up and said, this is the story. And he literally said, okay, 
who would you like me to make the check out for and how much do you need? Mm. And they were freed three days later. That's amazing. After 14 months of being locked up. Yeah. Mm. So the episode that aired uh, this week was Pacific Hajnumano's mm. episode and he's, I guess he had a similar sort of escaping, having to flee mm. from his country. I mean, Pacific was probably, it was living in, when I used to live in Cooparoo mm. um, and there's a big African community on the sort of inner southern suburbs of Brisbane, you know, a lot of Somalians. And I'd seen a young African guy just down at Stones Corner and he had a massive scar down the side of his face, all the way down here. And it couldn't look to me like anything other than somebody had hit him in the side of the head with a machete. And I remember looking at him going, what's happened to your life that you're here now standing in a, at a bus stop in Stones Corner going wherever you're going with this massive scar and the journey that you've taken to come along to get to this point and what you've dealt with. Have you made the decisions? Were you in charge of what was going on in your life when you got caught in this altercation? And how, do you, how did you get to Australia? So Pacific was a classic example. I really wanted to, to speak to a, an African refugee mm -hmm. and see what it was like, the journey that they took to get here. And, and Pacific was, a, you know, he was eight years old in Rwanda when the Hutus and the Tutsis took machetes to each other. Gosh. Bombs landed in his backyard and his family all bolted and um, it took about 14 years later before he was actually able to get refugee status here in Australia. Ultimately, it led to, it needed him to be in a refugee camp in Zambia with the guy who murdered his father in front of him, living in the tent next to him, making threats to him before anybody would actually say, OK, we do believe that you have the grounds for refugee status here to Australia and he's here a couple of days later. Yeah, it's a remarkable story. Wow, that's one of those, like the classic turning point of if he'd just gone a different direction, like to his father or to his mother, uh, it could have ended up so amazing. It was, it was literally like that. You know, it, it, it was a very convoluted and very mixed up situation because there was a lot of misinformation going on about who was saying what and who was in charge. The, the political powers at the time were actually putting words into the opposition. So it was very hard for the people in Rwanda to work out actually what was actually happening in their country. It must um, be quite an intense experience for you to have to interview people with such a, like a really intense story like that as well. Do you, did you find it difficult at times to... We, we, we did a lot of work, a lot of research getting into this and I don't think after 78 episodes of Meet the Ministers yeah. here on Briz 31 anything could be that hard because <laughs> some of them are a little dry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, that was amazing. But that's all we have time for right now. Up after the break, we'll be airing an experimental short film and we'll continue chatting to Sean Bindley. Don't go away. Welcome back to Showreel. That was Double Truth, an experimental short film by former Showreel volunteer Julius Lee. The film won the Jury Special Recognition Award at this year's Korean Film Festival in Australia. Right now, we're talking to 31's veteran talk show host, Sean Bindley. So Sean, um, what sort of challenges did you find like in having to create a show to go, you know, to be broadcast on television? Because that's a, not an easy task. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, I've been presenting shows down here for a couple of years now and I've been in the media for a, for a long, long time, so I actually do have a fair bit of experience. I guess th the biggest challenge is, is, back, is you know, balancing the lack of budget here mm -hmm. um, because we're, we're all volunteers, basically, so we're all beholden to people's time and availability and what can do and how, 
how uh, dedicated people are to the cause because in, in taking this on as, a, as the person with the initial idea, you're looking mm -hmm. for people who are willing to take on the idea and take responsibility for it and mm -hmm. run with it because we're all very busy, we all lead busy lives and the more people we can have who are passionate about a project, then the better the project can be. And I think I mean, you guys probably be experiencing that same thing, that the, the bigger the crew you have, the lighter the workload that yeah, it is. Definitely. Yeah, But as always with TV, you need to have something that people are going to watch. Mm. Mm. Um, so what, what other shows, can you tell us a bit about the other shows you've worked on here before or just generally in the media? Well, it was the infamous Meet the Ministers program <laughs> in which I interviewed every state government minister over the course of a year. Um, you. <laughs> which just about finished me as a television host. <laughs> <laughs> but after about 18 months away, I was uh, actually happy to come back here. And previously, that, I, I, I basically started as a volunteer a couple of years ago where I'd done a presentation course and I was interested in doing some more television presenting because I've been in radio for many years. Mm -hmm. And I rang the station up and said um, I'd be interested in doing some volunteering. And I had my own show two days later. Wow. <laughs> nice. Yeah, well, you've got to hit the ground running. You know, I mean, as anything, if you can show that you have the ability to, to do something, then there's always going to be an opportunity for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, because you also work in radio, yep. is that yep. correct? Yep. Um, I, I work at 98.9 FM in Brisbane. Nice. Um, I've been presenting a, a specialty music program there for 20 years this year. Wow, yeah. cool. Yeah. It's, a, it's a blues based music program, that's my particular passion. I've been a, a musician for, for many years as well and a, and a music promoter and a festival organiser and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So th that was a nice way for me to get involved in the entertainment industry way back in 1993 <laughs> when I first started out when I was coming to the end of my, my, my football career and I'd been looking around for something else to get involved in that I could be passionate about and yeah it's something very special to me I really enjoy it and I, you know I produce AFL broadcasts I'm currently working for the National Indigenous Radio Service as a sports reporter cool. um, which is another dream job for me. Yeah mm. what kind of drew you because football and then going into say presenting turning points is quite quite a jump there what what inspired you or drove you to be a presenter or get into the media like that? Oh, because I can't work for a boss. That's can't, and, and, <laughs> and about many years ago, I'd sort of decided that if I was going to live an interesting life that I could be happy with, I was going to try and do things that I was passionate about, mm -hmm. but not so much passionate about that I'd just get out of bed in the morning and go, wow, I'm going to work today, and that's a fantastic thing, you know? I mean, doing a radio show on Monday night, you know, so many people have this kind of Monday, I, just, oh. <laughs> I get up Monday morning and go, I'm going to do a four hour radio show tonight, and I'm going to pick the music that I want to play, and there's thousands of people all around the world who listen to it every week, yeah. and I'm going to get paid for it. So obviously you've had like an extremely long career in media. It, um, me and Claire want to get into something like that, like film we're studying. And mm. What sort of advice would you give to students like us and just in general? Don't put down any roots. Be prepared to move. Go where the work is. Mm -hmm. Get out of Brisbane straight away. Straight away? Really? Because there's no work here. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of the, the TV stations that do the major things are in Sydney or Melbourne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm getting calls for castings in Sydney sort of twice a week at the moment wow. because I'm busy at work. I just can't do But mm. the difference in productions going on in Brisbane and in Sydney and Melbourne is pretty remarkable. So I, I think if you're serious about a long-term career, you need to think about going where the work is. Many Australian, particularly crew, moving to the US these days. Mm, um, yeah. And a lot, you know, as far as film production, if you can get into the... TV commercial side of things, that's where the money is, but there's, you know, a, a select amount of jobs and lots of very talented people out there, yeah. but you've just got to be committed to it, you know, and constantly evolve and, and train and get more training and, and improve your skills and be there, put yourself forward and network, network, network. You've got to talk to people all the time and make sure that they know who you are and what you can do and what you can bring to the table to their project to make their project better, because you need to enhance what it is that you're going to be involved in rather than just taking up space and doing the job because everybody's looking to raise the bar with their projects. So if you can raise the bar with everything you do, you can be ahead of the pack. It's kind of testament to the fact that, you know, you came in here to say, can I volunteer two days later? You've got a show. They yeah. obviously know you and know what you do. And, but you've got to be ready to go with it as well. Yeah. You know, too many people have had opportunities presented to them and haven't been able to grasp it or have been a bit, oh, I don't know if I'm worthy. Mm. And the opportunity's always gone. There's always somebody else there. So if you're willing and ready with both hands to take an opportunity and you can run with it and hit the ground running, that's yeah. the old term in the media, then you're, then you're doing well. Mm. Have you got any projects you're sort of putting the feelers out for or you've got planning for the future? Oh, well, I mean, it's funny, but it's been a big turning point in my life for the last couple of years because mm -hmm. I've got a fairly substantial injury that I'm having to deal with on a, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, I'd been a, you know, a footballer until 1992 or 93 and then I've been a professional musician for about 15 years. And 
when this injury came about and I was really looking at not having a lot of quality of life, um, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life and I decided I'd, I wanted to start another aspect of my life and get away because I was very physical performer and I was doing a lot of driving up and down the coast all the time. It's late nights and not a lot of money, not a lot of satisfaction for, a, I guess, a normal family life. Mm -hmm. um, and I was keen to bring that into my home, with my, my relationship with my partner. And I'd always fancied doing more mainstream radio work, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. and, and more television and radio presenting. And I'm a voiceover artist, so I do t TV commercials and stuff. And I even do the occasional acting gig as well. Mm -hmm. But it was just an opportunity for me to try something again, to reinvent who I am and what I do for a life, for a living, yeah. and see where it takes me. That's amazing. It's really fascinating just where that has brought you. Yeah, yeah it's um. been a fun ride. <laughs> Well, we have to take a break, but we'll be back soon with our reviews of Thor, The Dark World. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Showreel. This week, Claire and I are reviewing the latest installment in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Thor, The Dark World. Thor, The Dark World, directed by Alan Taylor, is the 3D superhero action sequel to Thor, and continues the continuity of the Marvel films following the Avengers. Let's take a look at the trailer. You must be truly desperate to come to me for help. I wish I could trust you. If you did, you'd be the fool I always took you for. Before the universe, there was darkness, and it has survived. What's gonna happen? I gave you my word, I would return. Face an enemy known only to a few, known only to one. You even think about betraying him. Well, I'll kill you. That was from New York. I like her. Thor, your family, your world will be extinguished. The fabric of reality will be torn apart. I'll find a way to save us all. Thor. So despite my initial hopes and dreams to have my first review on the show be utterly shattering, I'm left to say only good things about Thor The Dark World. Good things and a few nitpicky things too, but you know, take what you can get. Okay, so I'll break this down into three segments. Plot, involving character, structure and dialogue, visuals, artistic decisions and the 3D feel, and general stuffs. Without spoiling it, which is kind of hard to do, Thor The Dark World is basically you know the part in Disney's Hercules where the fates are telling Hades the future? Yeah, well, that's it. That's the plot. Wow. In hindsight, yes, that is the plot. Okay, maybe Thor the Dark World might have been a bit too simplistic. Anyway, I'm getting off track. Thor is called upon to protect the Nine Realms after a really super dodgy and exposition-heavy prologue about Dark Elves and their quest to return the universe into the original darkness. Let's not get into the scientific credentials of this being true because I could keep you here all night. And yeah, I'm on a tangent again. Anyway, you don't need a Bachelor in Film to tell you how this film ends. The fact that I currently am studying a Bachelor in Film doesn't help me not spoil the ending for you either. You get the drift. Or you don't. Whatever, this is my first review. Don't look at me like that. Now, I'm the type of person who laughs in the movie when the protagonist gets punched in the face. So for anyone who has seen Thor The Dark World, you know I enjoyed it. Feverently. For anyone who hasn't, this film is fun and violent. Truth be told, I liked it more than the first one, though that's not saying that much. Thor was himself, Loki was himself, and the girl... For the death of me, I can't recall her name. Kate? Maybe it was Jean. Let's call her Jean. Whatever it was, she was herself too, so that was nice. I feel like the spiritual hero of the film was Darcy, and something about the whole interns, interns just made me happy. Perhaps it was the subversion of the sexy lamp trope, but I won't drink you down with my feminist commentary. The dialogue was quick, on the ball and witty. Characters were all relatively 3D. Ha ha, pun. Yes, hate me. And then it makes me more powerful. I thought the humor in this was really hit the spot, but then again, I laugh at people in pain, so maybe it only hit some of the right spots. Ha ha, more puns. I hope you appreciate this. The structure felt a bit squicky. Was that prologue honestly necessary? When you see it, you'll know what I'm talking about. I feel like they missed the chance to have a really cool Asgardian fairy tale slash animation come to life on screen, like they did in Harry Potter with the Deathly Hallows story. Wouldn't that have been amazing? Jane asks, WTF is going on? And the old father flicks open a damn fairy tale book and we get this violent, saturated, animated book and Thor going, ah yes, I used to love it when mother told this one. 
But no. Instead, we got a prologue reminiscent of every other Resident Evil prologue catch-up that fills you on and what happened in every other Resident Evil film. Annoying, not to mention condescending. If they had little tidbits splashed about in the story every now and then, the audience, namely me, would have felt smart at piecing everything together. Instead, they're like, here, have a slab of exposition. Let me explain you the plot, and do you want me to hold your hand when you cross the road? No, no, no. Visually, hells yeah. I mean, as a film student, I just sat there staring for a while. I get picky with the little things, like, was that shot honestly necessary? Why did they get so much coverage of the scene? And so little for this one. Man, do these guys even know the rule of thirds? Is that shot out of focus? Is that static green I see? Anyway, I'm gonna stop with the film talk. Visuals were good, art department was fairly nice. But by the all father who was on continuity, the amount of incongruities I counted during that film could make Count Dracula from Sesame Street faint from exhaustion. But yeah, maybe it's just me. I pay far too much attention to the small stuff. I do have to say though, sometimes the CGI look like cartoons. Like, yeah, okay, that's what CGI practically is, but there's a difference between something that looks like a cartoon and something that looks like a person. Sometimes this film didn't understand a line between the two things. It reminded me a lot of the CGI from The Hobbit. So if you don't mind some unbelievable CGI spliced into a hero who gets punched in the face, then this is your film. General stuff-wise, I liked it. The overall feel of For the Dark World left me with a good taste in my mouth. Unlike a lot of other films this year, which spiraled me into depression that only time fixed. I had fun watching it. I laughed, I had a good time, and the only thing going through my head that wasn't what I have already mentioned was, now that's thinking of portals. I give it one rainbow road out of nine realms. What did you think, Claire? Thanks, Jasmine. I really enjoyed Thor The Dark World. Visually, it looks cool. The costumes, set and special effects were all pretty amazing, as has come to be expected from the Marvel movies. The storyline was pretty enjoyable too. Some parts felt a bit predictable, but were nevertheless fun to watch. For instance, the comic relief provided by Jane's intern Darcy and her intern, the intern's intern, Ian, was a bit obvious. I didn't find it side-splittingly funny as some other members of the audience in the cinema when I saw it, but I think that humour is what sets the Marvel movies apart from the DC ones, like Man of Steel. It stops the film from going too dark and depressingly death-ridden. Overall, I found myself absorbed by the story. I like the effort the writers made to blend sci-fi and fantasy, like when Hawking's quantum physics meets Asgard's Soul Forge. One of the great things about all the Marvel movies now is that they have created this shared universe. So if, say, the creators of Thor want to get a certain other Marvel superhero in just for five seconds of comic relief, he's more than happy to appear, or he's contractually obliged to. Either way, the various nods to the wider Marvel universe were enjoyable and made the whole universe seem that bit more real. In my opinion, Malekith fell a bit flat as a villain, but then we were all really there to see Loki in that role, which was very well done, I must say. His charisma, cunning and sardonic wit were brilliant, despite starting the film off as a bit of an interplanetary emo. Some bits were a bit too convenient, like it just so happens that Jane absorbs the ether at just the right time when the Nine Realms are going to align. She just happens to be in the right place, it's Earth. Uh, and the nefarious dark elf Malekith awakens at just the right time to put his evil plan involving the ether into effect. Um, if only there was some way of stopping him. Luckily, Jane's scientific comrades from America are all inexplicably in London and the signs left by the ancient races of Earth point them to the perfect spot to stop the destruction of the Nine Realms. Good thing the Mayans left those stones laying around at Stonehenge. And all the better that you can take the London Tube three stops or so to prevent all life in the universe being snuffed out of existence. But then again, this doesn't make it unenjoyable. You have to have coincidence and convenience sometimes to keep the action going. And it's not like Thor is the first to take advantage of this. I mean, the Doctor always turns up on any given planet at precisely the right time to save the day. Fortunately, all of these planets seem to be in Cardiff, but that's for another discussion. I will say this though, he looks good in a fez. But back to Thor. Just a note on the continuity for those of you who've seen it. What happened to that massive monster from Jotunheim, the frost giant planet? Is it in London Zoo now or work in the checkout at Sainsbury's? Not a good idea to lose track of the whereabouts of a vicious man-eating beast. Anyway, despite those tiny faults, which I just found more comedic than annoying, I really enjoyed the movie. I give it four hoots out of five. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you for joining us, Sean. Oh, my pleasure, Jasmine. Yeah, it's been great having you. Thank, Thank you. you, Claire. Um, make sure to check out the Showreel podcast and our Facebook, Twitter and YouTube pages. Tune in next week for more Showreel. See you then.